Uh, welcome to Fertility Factor Fiction, one of the best shows on the web where we present uh, live data every week, review either an existing or upcoming article, and then go on to take your questions live and try and help you all through your fertility journeys. So uh, we've got a great topic tonight, an upcoming paper from Fertility or Sterility, talking about what elements of uh, intrauterine insemination are actually predictive of your outcome and whether or not you can predict outcomes. And I think this is a really eye-opening article for a lot of people because it's got several points that are really critical. And we end up focusing a lot on IVF in the infertility world, but IUI is actually far more common than IVF. And so it makes a lot of sense to spend a good deal of time dealing with that. So we want to make sure that we are covering those bases because many of you are exploring that potential avenue of therapy. And we want to make sure that we're addressing that for you. So uh, hopefully you've all had a good week. We always give everyone a minute or two to jump on board. So uh, we chit chat at the beginning. Um, for those of you that have been vaccinated, uh, my understanding is that that is very protective and I've now finished mine. Um, as you can see, I did not grow a second head or any extra appendages. So uh, nothing terrible happened to me. In fact, despite all the rumors, with my second dose, um, I had absolutely nothing other than a sore shoulder on the, uh, on the left side where I had my shot and I had it in the same place the first time. Um, you actually don't even feel them giving you the needle, so that's really the impressive thing. Um, and then afterwards, it was just sore for a couple of days. No fever, no chills, no weakness, no fatigue, nothing. I, I felt great actually, so it was, uh, it was pretty easy to deal with. Um, if you haven't been vaccinated, hopefully you will be soon. Nevertheless, um, the rates of infectivity have plummeted across the world. Uh, it's down 70% in Canada. It's down 76% in the U.S., which is really uh, um, helping to drive down the rates of, uh, uh, of complications from this virus. So hopefully we are nearing the end. I certainly don't think we're there yet, but I think we're getting there. And so uh, hopefully uh, you're all staying safe in the meantime. Okay, so uh, hopefully you guys have all had a chance to jump on board. You got your tea or your coffee or uh, something good to eat. Um, and as always, grab some chocolate. Dark in particular is good for you. So uh, this study is called Clarifying the Relationship Between Total Motile Sperm Counts and IUI Pregnancy Rates. So what this group did, it's an American group. They took a very large data set from one center and compiled a huge analysis of what was predictive in terms of IUI success. And the numbers are really quite staggering here. So uh, this study involved 92,471 insemination cycles. So this is a very large data set. And what they most wanted to know was whether or not your total sperm, motile sperm count, TMSC, was predictive of your outcome. So in other words, if you do this quick calculation, and I'll explain that in a minute, um, does it help predict what your outcome is gonna be? So the total motile sperm count is the volume of sperm uh, of ejaculate times the number of sperm times the percent that are motile. And that gives you a number. It does not account for the number that are abnormal, which is important because the ones that are abnormal traditionally are believed not to work. But currently, if you use what's called the strict criteria, you actually only need 4% normal to be normal. So, you know, that's probably playing less of a role. Uh, and so you have this total motile sperm count. And the question was, is there a threshold, a certain number above or below which is not worth doing IUI or you got a huge increase or a huge decrease? And so they basically took this massive pool they analyzed that number and then they did something extra where they controlled for the confounding variables like age and body mass index and so on to see if they could get a slightly more robust answer. So we'll go through the positives and we'll go through the negatives and we'll talk about it. So first thing is just the numbers, right? So as I mentioned, 92,471 uh, insemination cycle. So a huge number. They did lose a lot of them when they went to do the sub-analysis to estimate uh, what the impact of the confounding variables were. So almost 30,000. They were down to 62,758 cycles, but still a huge, huge number. 
Um, and so they go through this and they analyze all of the different variables to see what the impacts were. So uh, they used anybody that took Clomid or took um, Letrozole or did uh, FSH, which are the injectables. Um, they did not do um, natural cycles. Uh, everybody had some type of medication, so it was not uh, natural. They did also include the patients that had clomiphene and FSH injections together. Um, and that's important as well because that can often uh, help people keep their drug costs lower, but end up helping them with uh, the extra little boost that you get from doing the, the injectables. Um, the protocol was basically a, a standard um, protocol and they used one of two types of uh, sperm preparation protocols, one which is the centrifugation gradient, um, and that's quite uh, common. Um, and then they used another one where they had more of a, a swim up method. Um, so all of that was pretty uh, standardized. Okay, um, the total number of patients, 37,553. So again, a huge, huge, massive number of patients. And so what they did with all of this was they said, let's have a look first, and we're gonna turn to table one, and uh, we're gonna go over that. They said, let's have a look and see, let's just break apart the numbers and see if there's a threshold above or below which there is uh, either no difference or a significant difference in terms of outcome. So we got table one up there, fantastic. So if you're looking at table one, you can see that the very first row less than 0 0.25. So this would be considered an extremely low total motile sperm count, right? So you've got less than a quarter of a million sperm per milliliter, uh, or, or sorry, total of a, uh, less than a quarter of a million sperm that are in this total motile count. So that accounted for a small number of their cycles. Obviously most patients with such a low number would go towards IVF. There were only 263 patients, but 4. Point, almost 2% of them actually got pregnant. And these are clinical pregnancies, so they actually could see a heartbeat. Now, granted, not all of those are gonna go on to have live births, but that's pretty robust data, and most of those patients will go on to have a live birth. So even if you have a terribly low sperm count, this is showing you that you still have a 4.2% chance of success, which is fantastic because lots of people come in and they're told, oh, nothing but IVF is gonna work. And the truth is that's never true. And I tell all our patients, look, it's gonna be difficult. It may be very tough. You may have to try numerous times. And in the case of 4%, you're talking potentially you know, 25 tries before you're getting to a successful outcome. And it doesn't even actually work that way. It'd be more than that. But nevertheless, there is a chance. So if someone ever tells you, you your sperm count's too low, you can't do insemination, that actually is not true. You can do insemination. You just have to be prepared for a low percentage chance of success. If you go down a few rows, you can see once you're over one, you're getting about a 7.45% success rate. So even a really low count still with that total motile sperm count, you're still getting a decent chance of success. The real threshold number they reached was when you get over nine. Once you're over nine for your total sperm motile count, motile sperm count, you actually have a 16.7% rate and above that, it actually made no difference. Whether you went even higher or you stayed at that nine level, there was no increase in success. So there's two really important factors here to remember. Number one is that that threshold of nine is easily calculable by any patient on their own. You just need to know your ejaculate volume, you need to know how many of are in each milliliter, and you need to know how many of them move. So you can figure out from this table where you're gonna land and, and where your numbers are, your percentages. The other thing that's really critical to remember here is 16.7% were getting pregnant. So People always come in after they've done an IUI and say, why didn't it work? Well, keep in mind, even under the best of circumstances based on their calculation, you're getting a 16.7% overall rate. So this is including the Clomids, the Letrozoles, and the people doing the FSH. So at the end of the day, you've gotta be very realistic about your expectations for IUI because while it does work, you're getting that 16% chance 
it's not going to be 100%. It's not ever, ever going to be even close to 100%. And we do have other studies which we've reviewed previously on the show, which show that for younger women, once you get up to six tries, it doesn't work beyond that. And for older women, once you get over three tries, it really doesn't have a benefit either. So this 16.7% is per cycle, but keep in mind that you can't keep doing it in perpetuity. You will eventually tap out your success rate. Um, all the numbers that were below nine progressively went lower. So 14.3, 13.9, 12.87, 11.6. So as you can see, there's a, a decrease in your success as your TMSC goes down. So the next thing they wanted to do, and we're going to go to figure um, uh, one here, the, the bar graph, is they broke it down into different categories of confounding variables. So what's the impact of age? What's the impact of BMI? What about the stimulation protocol? And what about the cycle number if it was your first or your second or your third cycle? So these are all really important things to look at as well. So when you look at the impact of age, age has a very significant impact, right? If you're less than 35, that success rate was actually 18.5%. 35 to 37, it's 15%. 38 to 40, it's 13.4%. And over 40, it's 11.9. So that is a statistically significant decrease in success with each incremental increase in age. And we all know that that's true, but these numbers are really important because they're big, they're robust numbers, right? So I can tell my less than 35 year old that overall you have about an 18.5% chance. I can tell my over 40 year old, you have roughly about an 11% chance uh, or 12% chance. And that's really important to factor in. Interestingly, when they looked at BMI, they actually saw no difference across the different bands. Now, they haven't factored in other things here, including diabetes or whether or not your diagnosis was PCOS or uh, whether you're a smoker or a drinker or a marijuana user. I mean, there's lots of factors that go into this. This is just purely based on the BMI of the woman. And with that, they're demonstrating that there is no statistically significant impact of BMI. Interesting because we just presented last week uh, or two weeks ago that BMI actually does play a role. So this is the wild world of infertility. One study will show one thing and another will show another. But the study we reviewed pertained to IVF where we know for sure that BMI has an impact. This is insemination where it looks like it does not have as much of an impact if any. When they looked at stimulation protocol, you can see that when you took injectables only, it was a 19% success, so that's quite good. And then when you took clomiphene and FSH, you had a 15.2% and clomiphene alone was 16%. So interestingly, no difference between the clomid FSH or clomid alone. So obviously no need to add in the FSH there, but the FSH alone has a higher success rate than using FSH with clomid or clomid alone. So a uh, big difference there. Unfortunately, the shots are expensive and that's often the barrier for us. Or if you're a PCO, you gotta be really careful because we can easily turn you into Octomom. Um, and then we're all on a TV show together, which we definitely want to avoid. When they looked at cycle number, uh, they showed no statistically significant difference. So it didn't matter if you were in your first, your second or your third cycle, they had the same numbers there. So if you flip to table three, they actually show what the final outcome of all of this is. And they say your cycle outcome has a 2% difference. So they did find a bit of a difference there, but it's really, really minimal. Um, overall, cumulatively, they're saying up to three cycles, you get a smidgen of an increase and that's, that's a 2% increase, which is clinically kind of meaningless to be honest with you. Age had a significant increase. So for every change in year, you're getting a 5% decrease overall in success. Body mass index, they said had no impact and the clomid only had no impact. But when you jumped into the follicle stimulating hormone, the shots, you had a 27% increase in success rates for clinical pregnancy. So why is this important? Well, there are two critical elements to take or critical messages to take from this study. Number one, these guys obviously have a huge database and from that they've been able to tell us that if you calculate the total motile sperm count, 
and get that number right down to a, a precise number, you can tell roughly what your threshold of success is going to be just based on one simple calculation. So can you predict? You actually can. According to this, that number alone is sufficient to give you a very reasonable breakdown of where your chances are going to fall. The other thing that's really important from this is to understand that the numbers are very modest. So even in the best case scenario, the highest percentage they have here is looking at that shots only group where they got an, uh, an overall maximum percentage of 19%. So the, the success rates with IUI are always going to be modest. So when you're going down the IUI route, it's really critical from an emotional standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from a stress standpoint, even your relationship, all of those things. You need to go into it prepared for the fact that you may actually need to try multiple times. And even after trying multiple times, it may not work. You may still need to go to IVF because once you hit that limit of six, depending on age or three, if you're older, it's not going to work beyond that. And you're probably throwing money, valuable money away. And in particular, if you're in the U.S. where the IUI itself is insanely expensive, that's not going to be worth it for you. You're probably better off saving up your money going to a lower cost IVF center and doing your IVF there because your chances are going to be so much further ahead. So you got to be realistic about the expectations from an IUI cycle. It is not going to give you an 80% or a 90% or a 60%. So when you don't succeed, the answer to why it didn't work is often that's just the biology of what's happening. There is no way to improve it. So is it a factor of fiction that you can use your total motile sperm count to predict your IUI success? It's actually a fact. And there are several other factors you can use which are important, including your stimulation protocol and your age and the number of cycles that you've done, all of which can contribute to an improved success rate. And knowing what you are getting going into the cycle should really help guide your decision-making process. So I hope you found that useful. Make sure you like, comment, and share. We'd love for you guys to share the findings with your friends and other people you know of that are struggling through their own infertility journeys. And make sure that you let us know if you have any questions or concerns. We are always happy to answer them. And I've been jumping onto YouTube more lately to try and answer your questions directly as well. So we're going to go on to the live portion of the show. If you uh, want to ask us any questions, you certainly can there. And we have uh, a number of people that posted questions earlier on already for uh, our Instagram. Do you need my phone? 